On the following presentations, we focus on class differences in the, in the post-socialist period, the Macedonian, Bulgarian, and Romanian societies. Um, I'm very pleased we can welcome here um, Maria Marlene Nikolova. She's a, um, she's a cultural studies student and a founding member of Social Center Haspel. Haspel, sorry. So, and then on my left hand side, but next to me is uh, Kira Vasilio from Macedonia. He's a political activist, many, um, engaged in many grassroots, grassroots uh, initiatives, and he works um, for the Independent Trade Union um, for journalists and media workers. And next to him is sitting Florin Buenar from Romania. He's a co editor of. Attack and Lattice to well known Lattice web portal. So I suggest we begin. My client will be the first one. So please, the floor is yours. Um, so this paper is part of a report and research group uh, that's why I'm just um, still a bit overwhelmed by all this information. So, so, uh, around the last year saw the rise in the number of cognitive workers in Bulgaria in newly outsourced contact, call, and logistics centers, telecommunication firms, and IT support and development. By the end of 2013, about 70,000 workers were employed in the sector. By the end of 2014, about 70,000 workers in Bulgaria were employed in the sector and 30,000 in IT alone. This segment of the working class enjoys the highest le income levels. Average salary is about 850 euro with national average of solely 200 euro. This broad range of workers, along with other segments of cognitive workforce, um, such as artists, designers, various self-employed freelancers, etc., is usually subsumed under the rubric of the new middle class or the creative class. However, it is not only high-income parts of the working class that are included in this political subjectivity, but also public employees, for example, in public media, government bureaucracies, um, university staff and professors, and NGO employees. Despite their in internal heterogeneity, they are politically articulated by narratives of the new middle class or creative class, the rise of the knowledge economy and so forth. For instance, this could be seen in mass political mobilizations, such as the one in the summer of 2014, or in the environmentalist movement, arguably the central mm -hmm. social movement in Bulgaria since 2006-2007. Another moment of this political formation could be witnessed in various liberal mobilizations around cultural forms of struggles over the right to the city. That, this is to say, not for example around affordable housing or welfare, but about architectural heritage. In terms of sheer numbers, this is surely not the most important part of the workforce. Nevertheless, they prove to be formative of the production of hegemonic justifications of contemporary liberal capitalism in Bulgaria. Certain social positions, say university professors or journalists, uh, enable them to frame the coordinates of public debates and legitimate political distinctions and identities. This is why uh, it is nece necessary to engage in in-depth analysis of the political articulation of this so-called creative class in order to expose its internal inconsistencies, inequalities and tensions and thus destabilize the social conditions needed for the constitution of liberal hegemony. hegemony. This, however, cannot be done by simplistic bashing of the middle class as if it were a thing in itself, a pre-given substance, but only by concrete understanding, understanding of the relational conditions of possibility for its efficient categorization. Secondly, such an analysis has to take into account that any political intervention aiming to redraw class boundaries and the frames of class struggle cannot rely on mere intellectual and idealist assertions of certain objective social situations. 
a materialist approach would have to take into account that political identification is always embed embedded in concrete social practices and ultimately it is a question of political struggle. I am not saying liberal subjectivities or middle class identities are novel in Bulgaria, but especially since 2009, we do witness a new trend. What was importantly inherited from liberal mobilizations of the 1990s, however, are certain common signifiers such as democratization, transition, civil society development, anti-communism. But if mass anti-communist mobilizations of the 90s promised socialism would be displaced with a more just and egalitarian social structure, free of arbitrary state violence, modeled by the images of the Scandinavian welfare model, the new liberal anti-communism is much more elitist and exclusionary. As the Bulgarian sociologist Dejana Tsoneva points out, Liberal activists asserted cynically that the poor protested in February, while now the middle classes march not for material trivialities, but they say for values, against the shadow elite. In the 1990s, it was not uncommon to see slogans such as um, this one. It says, uh, this is a poster from the um, Agrarian uh, Union uh, election campaigns in 1990s. Uh, for um, Penny, so this is a city in the close to Sofia, and it says uh, power to the people, not to communism. Um, and uh, also down with the red bourgeoisie, uh, and then, yeah, this is down to the red bourgeoisie, this is part of the uh, 1990 protests. Um, and these uh, slogans were, uh, and posters were waved by trade unionists. But now many protesters held posters saying, um, we don't want anyone to, anyone to pay our bills, we could pay our, our bills alone. And this is part of the summer protests in two, uh, 2013 in Sofia. Uh, these are two uh, famous Bulgarian uh, conceptual artists, painters, and yeah, you can read what it says. Uh, even more eccentric were last uh, summer's riots in support of austerity. That is to say that the early 1990s promised the dissolution of the class society in some kind of an affluent middle class. But now, with the unfolding of the crisis, the middle class is becoming much more exclusive category, claiming to represent not the masses, but only a tiny entrepreneurially minded elite of creators of value, they say. As some of its organic intellectuals famously stated, stated last year, this is not the quantity but the quality of the nation. The so-called creative class claimed to be enraged by the fact that the government wants to increase budget deficit from 1 to 2 percent and hence redistribute and steal the value they claim to have accumulated themselves. What is needed is a closer look into the specificity of the formulation of the new the liberal hegemony in the current crisis. As I already said, it, I do not look into the category middle class as a sociological substance that could be simply ob objectively measured because uh, it is also formative of the condition of possibility for the production of its social con content. To put it shortly, the middle or creative class is in fact heterogeneous in terms of its relations to capital but it is being retroactively articulated as a coherent agent in political and cultural practices. It is key to unravel the social conditions that enable high-income cognitive workers, as well as low-income public media journalists, public university professors, precarious NGO bureaucrats, artists and designers, along with activists from industrial unions, to stand together and recognize themselves in a common political form which protests when fiscal discipline is in danger. In fact, the liberal classificatory struggle is efficient not because of shared income levels or consumption patterns, but also because of specific positions of authority that some of the people waging it occupy, enabling them to frame, to frame the coordinates of both public debate and legitimate social and political identities. Another important factor is the very physical locations that the social groups in question share, namely in Sofia, where NGOs and state, state bureaucrats, academics, artists, PR, HR, and marketing experts, corporate managers, journalists in big private and public media, as well as high-income workers in the newly outsourced industry. Program.
in order to trace the formation of the peculiar dispositions, enabling the institutionalization and subjectivation of this so-called creative class, we should look closer at the shared sources of information, political analysis, cultural practices and physical spaces. The shared schemes of perception of those that recognize themselves as middle class are conditioned by a variety of print and online on, and online lifestyle blogs and publications, right-wing dailies and weeklies, with liberally biased political commentaries, as well as cultural, cultural events, like this uh, conference TEDx. The literature that inspires many of the self-identified middle class fits well with Bob Jessup's argument that the narrative of the entrepreneurial city enables these, worker, these workers, I quote, to ascribe their successes to their own entrepreneurial talents, risk-taking, flexibility, or self-improvement, end of quote. Just to give you an example, um, this is one of the most active participants in the summer of the protest of 2013 in Sofia. Uh, she's a PR expert, political PR expert. Um, widely read is not only the self-help literature, but also the countless biographies of Steve Jobs, Ayn Rand, and the works of Malcolm Gladwell and Richard Florida. These type of workers often share common physical space. A few co-working spaces were established in the last years, such as one called Beta House, or another called Soho, referring to New York's gentrified neighborhood. The owners of both were actively involved in the prosperity and communist protest movement of the summer of 2013. For example, uh, Better House managers provided office equipment and free Wi-Fi connection in front of Parliament in July so that protesters can will willingly subject themselves to everyday work discipline while at the same time fulfill their civic duties as members of the common political sphere. Not everyone can afford, uh, can afford to work while enjoying the company of other creative artists and precarious NGO workers at the co-working spaces and sharing know-how. A person should spend 120 euros in order to rent a desk for a month at one of these spaces. Precarious freelance workers also share another type of spaces, namely coffees. Uh, some of the people working from their laptops at coffee shops actually enjoy the perks of being a part of a formal organization, governmental or governmental, corporations also, with its own space. For example, these workers rely on the organization's team and its various social connections. But they unburden themselves from the load and the costs for thousands of documents, machines, and also the, the administrative duties and the labor required for the physical reproduction of the space. Despite the seeming flexibility that these conditions presuppose, the low and insecure income uh, requires from these workers that they dedicate a lot more time to their jobs. Freelance working um, at offices and co-working spaces, uh, freelance workers at offices and co-working spaces share that their work spans from 10 to 14 hours and the weekend is no exception. The work day at a office or a co-working space is also a work day that is no longer free of consumption. Um, you are constantly tempted by muffins, cupcakes, lattes, fruits provided by local organic food cooperatives, alternative gigs, exhibitions and DIY workshops. The expansion of outsourcing is transforming not only Sofia's central part. The biggest achievement of the so-called creative industry is located in the eastern part of Sofia, a 300,000 square meter business park hosting, among, among other, uh, others, HP's huge back office and IBM's global delivery center. The business park is a small version of the city, with restaurants and coffee shops, grocery stores, cinema, post office. Here, one's workday is also not devoid of consumption. You have to be at all times engaged in trainings, relaxation activities, team buildings, or just let yourself be entertained. That doesn't mean we could subsume all cognitive workers into one, because even those engaged in productive practices, say designers, do not always sell their abstract labor power separated from the means of production to the capitalists, but have to self-exploit themselves themselves and extraction of values done via rent, licenses, control over access to markets, social networks, etc. Thus, there is a constant urge to revolutionize the productivity of one's own labor power 
by a wide range of self-help practices or the active participation in relevant social networks by, say, unpaid labor, voluntary or internships. Um, so a number of NGOs specialized in discipline in this segment of the workforce organized trainings on how to be creative, becoming a change maker, lifelong learning, entrepreneurship, etc. All of this, binded, binded with precarious income and working conditions, creates huge and permanent inequalities within the cognitive workforce. Other lines of distinctions are drawn within and between the ranks of NGO employees, journalists, artists, public employees, and university professors. With the onset of the new public management and generally the penetration of the market logic into the public sector, public employees are subject, subjected to bourgeois forms of discipline. For example, university professors and school teachers cannot survive on their salary, salaries alone, but have to con constantly apply for temporal projects for public or private funding or co on competitive basis. This is coupled uh, with efficiency assessments on which their salar salary depends, pitting against each other individual workers as well as institutions. However, material conditions do not necessarily breed continual political identities. For example, it was not uncommon in the last years that university professors and students mobilized in support of more genuine implementation of the Bologna system. There, comparable developments in the artistic sphere, say in public theatres, where also similar processes of introduction of neoliberal managerial practices of commodification, pragmatization and standardization of artistic work was pushed by the state and by artists themselves. <coughs> in the short time frame, this allows me to go into all the details of the research I've done, but I'm trying to call for empirical analysis of the specific forms of expertise and inequalities within the so-called creative class, which will allow the radical, the radical left to address the issue in a more consistent way. Up until now, in Bulgaria, there was a simplistic critique of this articulation of the middle class, a critique that treated, is, uh, treated it as an immediate social fact. In its worst form, this critique sees some coherent comprador bourgeoisie, where a much more complicated array of class positions exists. This array includes in itself both comprador and national bourgeoisie, such as CRIP, the big business chamber in Bulgaria, public employees, and highly precarious cognitive workers. Moreover, such a position is completely incapable of analyzing the internal inequalities within the so-called middle class in general. This is why such pseudo-populism rests on reductionist, normative, and exclusionary understanding of the people uh, limited to imaginary common Bulgarians that are usually impersonated by the abstract figure of the pensioner. It is precisely the figure of the victimized pensioner that is often raised by the mainstream left, namely the BSP, the Socialist Party, against the last, uh, the last summer's protests, protesters from the self-styled middle class. Such a stance accepts the supposition of the liberal elite which they pretend to criticize. Firstly, the assertions that, that the members of the so-called creative class share identical space with re within relations of production. And secondly, that what is needed is redistribution of value supposedly produced mainly by the middle class towards welfare for the passive pensioners, ethnic minorities, the sick, the unemployed, the underclass, and the poor in general. For instance, for instance Georgi Ganev, a mainstream liberal economic expert wrote in 2013 that the bourgeoisie, I quote, uh, the bourgeoisie is the only adversary of the coalition between the poor and the oligarchs. Thirdly, the, accept the acceptance of the new liberal framing of the class structure of Bulgarian society is not solely empirically and conceptually confused, relying on simplistic and exclusionary understanding of the ordinary Bulgarians. But moreover, it gives up the battle for hegemony before it had even started. It is possible to think of ways to dismantle the mobilizing power of such discourse and to offer shared spaces for the creation of new identifications based on shared positions in the relations of production, but also based on common cultural practices. I'm here not calling for the withdrawal of the radical left into the cultural sphere, but as I said in the beginning, a materialist understanding of the practical conditions for the articulation of political subjectivities, taking the role of symbolic, intellectual, and theoretical production seriously. 
In other words, not for the deployment of identity politics, but for the realization of the practical conditions for recognition of a common interest. benefited 
from this crisis in the medium run because the large supply, the supply of petrodollars coming from the oil countries in the international financial markets allowed access to cheap credits circulated through Western banks. This money was used to finance the further development of industrial commodities, especially petrochemical products, which were then very expensive on the world market. Uh, uh, in the detriment of the coal, uh, the local coal industry, which led in 1977 to uh, the strikes of the miners, one of the biggest uh, strikes uh, during communism in, in Romania. The second oil crisis of 1979, however, proved to be disastrous. The government was forced to borrow extensively in order to be able to maintain the supply of oil for its uh, growing industrial needs. Moreover, this oil crisis overlapped with the financial one, triggered by the increase of interest rates on sovereign debt. In plain language, the era of cheap money for development was over, signaling, in fact, the global reorientation towards financial speculations for profit accumulation of the Western poor country, a process that we today call neoliberalism, though I'm not sure it's exactly the correct word for that. Facing a twofold crisis, with global roots and being in the impossibility to repay the debt, the regime turned, of course, towards IMF, signing a three-year agreement in 1981. The IMF program sought to make state enterprises less dependent on the state budget in order to function on a profit-based logic, while making them more responsible for capital uh, allocation and investment. In practice, the IMF program was a very harsh austerity program of limiting the state expenditure, implemented with the full force of the communist state. While the goal of paying back the debts to Western creditor was largely achieved, this left the economy in ruins and the society in shatters. The attempt to brutally and radically cut off the country from the global financial flows and credit uh, dependency proved elusive and ended in disaster, and the regime soon collapsed. In its efforts for fast industrialization, what the Communist Party seemed to disregard was the global capitalist context in which it operated and the fundamentally capitalist nature of the industrialization program. In this context, the economy of the country could not be simply sealed off within the national borders of will and instead remain highly dependent on global capital and vulnerable to its crisis and transformations. This was so because there was, and of course it is, a fundamental misbalance, uh, an uneven development in the world system as such. Development in the East, but also uh, in the global South, was possible based on loans from the Western countries in the short uh, era of cheap credit uh, at the end of the 60s and the beginning of the uh, 70s. These loans created the industrial infrastructure and the cheap industrial labor force capable to facilitate the delocalization of the Western industries in the 1970s and 1980s. This locked them in correlation of dependency and vulnerability, even though it also led to very palpable modernizing achievements. Moreover, the demand for loans sped up the financialization of the world system and accelerated processes of globalization and transnationalization. Far from preventing the expansion of global capital, Eastern uh, European communism, in fact, facilitated. These dramatic changes in the economy, rooted in local and global dy dynamics, entailed, obviously, a profound shift in the local class structure and reshaped in various ways previous class relations and dynamics. Their inter interplay, both before and after 1989, cannot be abstracted from this wider uh, history. As I have noted, the industrialization process led to the creation of industrial workers out of backward and poor peasant populations. The well-known industrial uh, story of bringing peasants into uh, industrial uh, uh, production as wage laborers. But what is less obvious uh, is that communism also created an increasingly highly specialized class of technical and humanist intelligentsia, indispensable for the requirements of production, distribution, planning, export and financial trading, especially within the transactions uh, with the West after uh, joining the IMF in 1971-1972. Gradually, from mid-1970s onwards, precisely by virtue of its ob objective position within the relations of production of communism, this class saw its interest moving closer towards global capitalism and away from the local Communist Party. Better educated and better skilled, this class mediated between the interests of the Communist Party for its development and uh, the interests of Western capital uh, to expand while occupying strategic positions in the local institutions and economy. At the same time, however, this class was frustrated that it could not capitalize upon this strategic position since it remained subordinated politically to the party and symbolically to the working class. The political form of the party state and its virtual monopoly was a stumbling block for this class. Therefore, the rapid dismantling of the communist state and the full opening up to the, uh, to the global economy of uh, capitalism represented a political block. Nonetheless, prior to 1989, the intelligentsia was not able to 
political representation to its demands and never succeeded in giving its interests an expression of class solidarity, preferring instead to withdraw into an area of private accumulation and consum consumption. Concomitantly, lower and local ranks uh, of the Communist Party were also disenchanted uh, since, in their turn, they were prevented from fully exploiting their own strategic position within the Communist economic process. Especially at local levels, many communist apparatchiks de facto controlled the production and distribution of goods, making them the pillars of the economic system. But the hyper-centralized, patriarchal and ossified structure of the communist party held in check their ambition to acquire capital and properties in their own hands. In 1989, in the context of internal collapse and increased internal uh, pressures, both from the West through the IMF demand of debt repayment, and from the East during Gorbachev's reforms, the technical intelligentsia and the lower echelons of the party entered into coalition with the aim of overthrowing the party state, which became politically and historically obsolete. In this process, they partnered with the intellectual dissidents for international legitimacy and mobilized the working class for fomenting the events leading to the overthrowing of the regime. But the interests of the intelligentsia and of the lower apparatchiks coincided only in the short term. Once the common goal of overthrowing the regime was achieved, their antagonistic interests soon became apparent and their alliance was short-lived. Following 1989, based on their previous position, the former apparatchiks quickly acquired political power, while many of them managed to become also prosperous local owners of capital by using their political positions and connections. What is to be noted, however, contrary to popular belief, is that most of the local owners of capital that emerged after 1989 were not at the top of the Communist Party, but rather belonged to the strata of factory directors and state and party bureaucrats. They used their local positions and knowledge in order to amass even more power and capital through the privatization process of the 1990s, organized by their political bodies in their favor. Meanwhile, the technical intelligentsia found itself estranged yet again, but lacked any political form of expression and knowledge how to organize itself. Subsequently, many migrated to better paid job, jobs in the West, whereas those that stayed behind embraced neoliberalism with the purpose of modernizing the country by erasing the legacy of the communist past. But in fact, neoliberalism, through the unhindered rule of global capital it entails, not only defeated this class, but it was also helpful in the struggle against the local owners of capital. Thus, anti-communism and neoliberalism became the twin almost indistinguishable ideological pillars of the transition. This uh, class struggle between the intelligentsia and the local owners of uh, capital after uh, 1989 unfolded against the former industrial working class, considered the experimental remain of the communist regime that had to be disposed of. Most of it was declassed and the younger and more flexible segments of it were pushed into migration following massive unemployment. This process was facilitated by structural global conditions as well. The high demand for cheap labor in the southern economies of Spain and Italy, triggered by a financial boom of cheap credit coming from German and other four EU banks uh, at the end of the 90s and beginning of the 2000s. The remittances they sent back home helped to keep afloat the former industrial workers, an increasingly uh, pauperized population that had to go back to agricultural work in order to diversify income when their pensions and life savings plummeted under the so-called neoliberal reforms. When in 2004 the intelligentsia finally acquired full political state power, the pace of opening up to the global capital at the expense of the local owners of capital was some substantially increased manifested primarily through the, through the dramatic surge in national and private debt. Just like in the 1970s, by the middle of the 2000s, the intelligentsia now in power was promoting economic growth based on foreign credit. This indeed created a significant new segment of class, the famous middle class, uh, uh, that was necessarily placed on the side of capital and thus politically inclined to the right and to conservative values. It also entailed the dramatic debasement of wider social segments, which were pushed into structural poverty and deprived of basic social services and means of social reproduction. Even prior to the 2009 crisis, inequalities went through the roof and reached historic proportions that only deepened after the crisis, after the crisis ensued. This process of class domination would have not been possible without acquiring hegemony over the state, which increasingly has only a repressive role tasked to bring to order whomever stays in the way of capital accumulation. Shielded in this way, the accumulation of capital, usually by direct extraction now, as it is the case in uh, Rocha Montana, with the gold uh, mine exploitation and uh, the fracking, uh, the shell gas uh, exploitation by Chevron in the eastern part of the country, which generated uh, last year's uh, protests in Romania. This, this way of uh, direct uh, accumulation, direct extraction of uh, resources, 
um, continuous apace in a context that signals a deep peripherization and reprimarization of the country and uh, of the economy. Now, you might ask at this point, what is the practical relevance of all this for leftist politics? My argument is that we need to ask what are the precise historical, ideological and social conditions under which struggles to articulate left politics, groups and sensibilities uh, are uh, unfolding and are uh, being created. What are the conditions of left movements that emerge under such structural pressures? Therefore, we need to account simultaneously for the wider dynamics of the crisis from global capitalism, but also for the specific local histories and transformations. I try to do this here, to offer a historical description that has a political dimension by identifying the social space in which class relations and class struggle uh, unfold. This brings me to my final point. I believe that a good theory of class should tell us not necessarily what class is, but what class does. Recognizing the objective existence of classes and their structural antagonism is just a starting point. The true task seems to be to discern, to discern their inter interplay in concrete particular circumstances shaped by global relations of production and accumulation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Florin. And now it's your turn, Kira. Okay, so let's now. Thank you, Rush. Uh, the title of my presentation is Macedonia, the non-integrated periphery of Europe. Uh, however, I think that more suitable it would be like Macedonia, the social dystopia, or Macedonia, the periphery of the periphery. I can even go Macedonia, the ghetto of Europe, but that's too urban for my taste. Um, and I'm Macedonian, it's all about the name for us. Uh, since the breakup of ex Yugoslavia, Macedonia, striving for European, European integration, had to make reforms to satisfy the neoliberal European market. Uh, and we did. Since then, we constantly find each other on the very social bottom of Europe. Uh, for Macedonia, the period of transition from one institutional system to another, besides being a traumatic experience, led to establishment of uh, new institutions and new division of power. And in recent history, Macedonia made a clear cut with all elements of redistribution and rights like labor, social, educational, health, uh, that are essential for protection of workers and common people, got uh, drastically reduced. Uh, therefore, the question of who won and who lost in terms of political and financial power uh, has been one of the most discussed questions in, um, in recent history. Uh, however, the problem of this debate in the Macedonian mainstream is that the main argumentation is based simply on party allegations instead of a serious analysis of the structural, structural position of the Macedonian economy. Um, even so, at present times, Macedonia has a problem of uh, how to place itself in the neoliberal European market. Uh, the weak state has to open its borders uh, and prepare for foreign competition by making the environment uh, investment friendly. And we all know what this means. Um, blandishing to big investors is uh, not an abstract idea. It is not that we only have to be polite to, to investors. For big business, we have to reduce workers' rights, uh, reduce social transfers to minimum, reduce taxes and eradicate all administrative barriers to foreign companies, even give benefits to most of them to invest in Macedonia. Um, and this ideology took deep roots. Uh, however, the idea of capitalistic utopia took a different path, um, a path of social regression with elements of dystopia. Uh, now Macedonia is partially integrated in the market structure called the EU, uh, with no chances uh, of mobility for workers, uh, and with no chances for solidarity from the rich national states that have the best position in this unfairly structured economy. Uh, consequently, um, Macedonia is the most class differentiated society in Europe uh, while regressing on all scales that measure democracy uh, and freedom. Uh, concerning social re regression, the impoverishment in the Republic of Macedonia cannot be located only in the years of the crisis. Uh, the privatization, suppression of workers' rights, and the reduction of all mechanisms of uh, redistribution made a constellation of 10% of the richest people to, all, to own uh, more than the rest of the 90%. Unfortunately, the tendency is showing that instead of uh, reducing these differences, uh, are getting bigger. Flexibility of labor, for example, which is a major condition uh, for foreign investment, allowed only higher profits for big companies while wages and productivity remained at a uh, very low level. Uh, flexibility of labor means that the workers are the ones to make compromises, uh, not the business. Uh, 
and as a result the constitution of labor uh, relation, law and labor, uh, had to be adjusted almost every time when a bigger investment was, uh, was notified. Uh, the biggest cha changes included drastic reduction of rights of workers that are defined as redundant during the privatization period. Uh, the privilege of the employees to discharge workers without a notice period is now introduced. Uh, the right to strike is uh, significantly impeded. Uh, the legally guaranteed vacation period is decreased. Now the workers are obliged to work um, whatever the boss tells them to, even, that is not, even if that is not in line with their job description or skills, and um, education of course. Uh, the period for part-time work before permanent employment is uh, extended from one to five years, etc. Uh, the same goes for social rights, especially the social assistance. Uh, the social support is, in recent years is reduced 40%, and not just from the total amount of households that get social assistance, but uh, also from the amount of money that, that one takes for, for social support. Uh, moreover, in 2008 and 2011, new amendments to the law of contribution for mandatory social insurance uh, were established and with them the maximum basis for calculation and payment of contribution is the amount of six average uh, gross salaries. This means that the few people that take the highest salaries uh, have the privilege to pay contribution only to small portion, six average gross salaries uh, of their income which automatically reduces the financial transfers to the common social budget. Um, on top of this the main tax is filling out the central budget the value-added tax and the personal income tax are flat and low. Uh, the value-added tax is 18% and the personal income tax is 10%. Uh, this means that uh, poor people pay more to the central budget than the rich. And if they pay more, they, at least they should expect more, but of course not. In 2012, the government, in accordance with the Chamber of Commerce, decided that the minimum salary per month uh, should be set on 130 euros. Um, well, the biggest reported salary is constantly uh, increasing from 20,000 euros in 2008 to 92,000 euros in 2011. Um, but what can one expect from a country that has 30% of uh, unemployment rate with 55% of youth unemployment and 24,6% uh, of children living in families with not even one employed parent? Uh, a country where the margins of relative poverty or people that earn money but not enough to get involved in the cultural, social and economic life is set on 30.4% and it's getting bigger um, and the country where the absolute poverty probably one of the biggest problems of, of, of Macedonia or the people that live under uh, $2 per day is uh, set on 14.7% a number which is increasing all the time uh, as a main result of these policies, the data from the World Bank, Bank shows that Macedonia is the most class differentiated society in Europe and the former SSSR republics with Gini index of 43,6. Uh, just as Balkan comparison, the Gini index in Croatia is 33,7, in Serbia is 29,6, in Albania is 34,5. Even in Bosnia, where we have big social unrest motivated by class differences, the Gini index is 36,2. Um, Therefore, the, the Macedonian plutocracy has accumulated so much power in the public domain that people hear only their messages, and their messages are always in form of nationalism to gain votes and depolitization to disregard criticism. Uh, besides that, the conservative government is replacing uh, the abolished social and democratic gains with ad hoc populist measures, which are not sustainable in the long run, and are part of the charity public profile of the authoritarian prime minister. Uh, concerning the alternatives, not a lot of people are aware that uh, in Macedonia we had continuity of protests opposing this uh, politics and maybe one of the most positive uh, resistance were uh, the social movement. Uh, starting from 2009, uh, 2009 sorry, Macedonian activists started protesting against the nationalistic, undemocratic and ecologically hazardous project of the government called Skopje 2014, um, the monuments and all that. Um, then followed the protests against police brutality in 2010, the protests against restoration of the ecologically hazardous silent foundry in Veles in 2011, and the last one being uh, Aman, the protest against the rise of electricity, gas and heating prices in 2012. However, the reach of this movement stays small and isolated. As for the trade unions, there are four major trade unions and two independent branch unions. Uh, the major unions are always close to the conservative ruling party and never oppose policies from the government. Uh, 
the two small branch unions, the Independent Union of Journalists and Media Workers, I'm representative of that union, and the Union of Clinical Center are the ones that uh, give hope that at least somebody uh, uh, cares for workers' rights. However, uh, they have a big problem with, we have a big problem with social dialogue since the government doesn't recognize our arguments, neither our existence. Um, the leftist organizations are rare, small and not well organized. Uh, we are still stuck in debates whether we should take money from foundations or not, uh, which groups are eligible for our, for our cooperation and which are not, uh, what kind of activities are typical for leftist movements and which are not, and all kind of different questions. Uh, which are useless and energy absorbing. However, the leftist group um, play a crucial role in, in organization of popular movements when some event provo provokes the masses uh, on the streets in Skopje. Uh, it is obvious that Macedonia is struggling with the alternative because there is a lack of political will to establish even the most basic uh, egalitarian policies. Uh, the biggest oppositional party, for example, the Social Democratic Union, uh, it's not just that it doesn't have the answers to the class disparity, uh, but also participated in creation of these differences during the years of the transition. So their credibility is far gone. Um, that is why maybe the only thing we have left is a, a big bang, a small revolution. Uh, because the position of the Macedonian economy, whether from inside or outside, uh, creates inequalities that uh, produces devastating consequences on living standards and individual well-being. Uh, besides the poor, poor working conditions, people living in this territory struggle with bad diets, uh, bad social and health protection, which increases the rate of illness, suicide, um, and imprisoned people, and decreases life expectancy, educational performance, uh, etc. It is not a coincidence that in search for better life, uh, 230,000 mostly young and educated people emigrated from Macedonia between the years 2008 and 2012. Uh, most of them left because uh, they couldn't find a place in this whole society. And those who stayed, majority of them critically obeyed the uh, governmental politics. So now Macedonia is left only to them and the monuments. <laughs> between people who work in an NGO or people who work in a public institution uh, and have a full-time employment, does that have any role in what you're trying to talk about or is that irrelevant? I would say it's more of a decision, but it's mostly, it's, it's like we are Uh, that we need to think about 
Class, what class does and not what class is. That's what I said. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, I was trying to emphasize that uh, basically um, what uh, class is determined by the class dyna by the, the dynamics, the, the way the, in the interplay between classes. I think it's, uh, you can do that absolutely and theoretically, and I think there is probably some, there are some good works on that as well. Like, you know, trying to pinpoint the basic features of uh, the capitalist class, the basic features of the uh, working class. Like, I don't know, the working class has to enrich in uh, wage to labor in order to survive. Like, I agree, I mean, there are these kind of basic features that we can identify in a particular society. But from there on, I think it's very important to look at the way in concrete situations this relationship articulates itself. Because it can take very different forms, this relationship between the two classes or the segments of classes this interplay uh, produces and, and, uh, and so on. So I think that's why my, my uh, idea is that we should look at um, this dynamic of what the actual relationship between the two classes uh, is in a particular context and in a particular moment. The third question was, uh, I'm curious, you said that you, are, that you work for the union, no? Yeah. And it's like the independent union and that the government doesn't recognize you. Why? I mean, what is the reason? In what way don't they recognize you? Well, you see, every time when some trade union gains uh, public authority, um, the thing is they always form a parallel uh, union. So they have a union uh, with which they communicate and it's under their control. So our trade union is just dealing with the public opinion. You know, they cannot, uh, we cannot communicate with the owners of the medias, either with uh, ministries or government or whatever. Like. They don't even invite us to public debates. Not that there are public debates, but if they organize something similar, we, we don't exist for them. I mean, we're, we're, we're completely marginalized. If you don't obey governmental politics, then you, you don't have a place in that society. Question for uh, Kirit. It's um, I would say that the uh, Macedonian situation is uh, uh, a very interesting one in a very morbid way, but it, it can it almost seems like a possible configuration of strategies of the uh, rural classes, especially peripheral countries, uh, how to, uh, how they react when when they meet the structural limits of what can be done within uh, capital. What I'm uh, referring to is um, basically, uh, the drift of the, of, the, of the conservative party from a mainstream conservative party, which was technocratic in its, in its image, in its self-projection, and in its program, uh, promising like technocratic rational reforms of this and that, and, and, and blah blah blah, and then um, it's then it's this sudden shift towards uh, a completely different uh, strategy of, of uh, representation, like. Uh, uh, this emphasis on the nationalism and, and this disnification, not only of, of the, the landscape of the city, but of the ideological, ideological imaginary in a very authoritarian uh, uh, way. So, I, for, for one, I don't know if you agree with, with, this, uh, with, with this thesis that this has happened. Obviously, I'm one of the influence of having talked to Artem about these things. And maybe you can uh, uh, um, elaborate for those people who, who, who don't see it, because I think that this is a really um, maybe a level of possible um, scenario which, which, which we see, um, which can be compared, I think, at the moment only with the, the Hungarian uh, situation. Yeah, I, I agree partially with you, yeah, of course, but you cannot compare it with the Hungarian um, uh, situation because Hungary is part of the EU, at least they have political partners, we are closed. But we don't have any communication with the European Union anymore. Everybody sees that it's an uh, authoritarian regime, but every time when we see a uh, report from the European Commission, for example, it's always with uh, the diplomatic vocabulary. You know, because, uh, things are not progressing, but they're in a good way, and blah, blah, blah. So we are left on, on our own, right? Um, when it comes to the authoritarian regime, yeah, at, at some point, it, it's not that at some point they switched. I mean, the institutions were, the institutions were really fragile. They, they just took advantage of it. So now when you say the state, you say the party, or when you say the party, you say the state. You know, there are parallel rules behind the institutional rules. But the institutional rules, the institutions are there just to, uh, ju just for the formal part.
also you can communicate with the, uh, let's say the European Union, the United States or whatever. But when it comes to the substance, the, 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 the main rules are the rules of the party. So if you want to get employed or if you want to do some business, you, you completely have to obey the, the, the ruling party rules, which are parallel to institutional rules. So you don't agree that there was deliberate opportunity to calculate and switch to that national from this technocratic system? Oh yeah, yeah, of course there is now. Yeah, yeah, there is always, because they know that, uh, I actually said it in my presentation, that they use nationalism to, uh, it was a nice sentence. <laughs> Nationalism to gain votes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they use nationalism to gain votes and depoliticization to disregard the criticism. Every time when you go out uh, in the public sphere and you say something against the government, immediately you're labeled that you're from the opposition, but that doesn't make any sense, you know? And when they say that you're from the opposition, immediately you're marginalized. Your arguments are not valid anymore. Nobody's listening to you. That's, that's the, the scariest part. And we, as leftist organizations, we have that problem all the time, fighting inside. Like, if we say this, uh, it, it's somehow close to the oppositional party, so they're going to say, okay, you're social democrats, and immediately everybody's going to marginalize because they think that uh, the oppositional party paid us to say that. You know, it's just it's a really crazy and stupid situation. But, Um, I have a slightly naive uh, question uh, to you, uh, Peter. Um, it's really, I mean, uh, Macedonia is really peculiar, uh, uh, I mean, case because in spite of being the peak of uh, so-called Thracian uh, Romanticism, is uh, actually earlier you stated that uh, nationalism here uh, serves only to gain votes. I mean. The problem is in, um, in Macedonia that they have politicians like Gergevsky who are, who are, who are defending like uh, the idea of great Bulgaria, I mean. And on the other side you have like, uh, uh, you have Albanians who would like to annex to Albania. I mean, okay, I know I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, simplifying uh, a lot, but I mean, uh, since we are, since you were discussing about the aggravating situation in Macedonia, it's probably also time to start thinking about uh, certain s solutions. And uh, what is your uh, idea, here, idea here? Those are marginal ideas. I mean, those are isolated people who have some idea that nobody listens to. You know? Not even Luke Georgievsky, who was our ex-prime minister, probably one of the most democratic prime ministers. And he has a Bulgarian passport, right? You're talking about that. He doesn't support uh, big Bulgaria now. I don't think that he does. But, you know, he's some kind of a rational historian who knows history and knows that we are not uh, anti-Greeks and the antique culture is not ours. You know, he's just reading history, so he's acting the way he, he, he reads. I don't know. Those are isolated, isolated ideas. The majority of people completely obey uh, ruling party politics uh, because there's a system of clientelism, you know, everybody's dependent on, on the political party. Well, yes, but I mean, where does it come from? Where does the money come from for, uh, for building Porta, uh, Porta Macedonia? Uh, from credits. Where is that? <laughs> well, what Germany, I don't know. Well, what German problem? banks, <laughs> Deutsche Bank. <laughs> Nobody knows, we don't have uh, transparency, so they get money all the time and we don't know. Probably Skopje 2014, the numbers that we got is uh, around 800 million euros, just for monuments. And that's the unofficial number. The number that we got is probably much higher. Uh, okay, I have a question for Lili. You were talking before uh, about the situation in Romania um, and uh, the case of um, privately managed uh, state-owned er enterprises by the Templeton Fund, if I'm, uh, if I'm correct. And could you update us on, on, this, uh, on this topic? Because this is quite relevant also here in Slovenia. There have been many suggestions that, uh, that the state national holding should be managed by some uh, private hedge fund or something like that. Can you tell us something about this? 
Yeah, well, before 89, uh, there was no uh, private uh, control or private management of the state-owned factories and uh, units of production. Uh, they, uh, there were this uh, kind of mixed um, uh, factories with, uh, for example, Ford or uh, some uh, uh, Renault for building uh, cars and so on. So it was a, a mixed ownership or state, and uh, but usually the um, control was in the hands of the party uh, representatives. Uh, what happened after 89, of course, was that um, most of the industry was privatized uh, and whatever was left uh, uh, for the state. Um, it was, uh, at the beginning, uh, it was uh, organized and um, I, I, I lost, I, I was thinking of two things at the same time. Okay, I'll go back. <laughs> uh, yes, okay, so uh, after 89, the, the uh, things that remain in state uh, ownership, there were indeed uh, sources for um, uh, extracting uh, capital for uh, party uh, uh, interests. So there was an interest to have this uh, under uh, state control because they uh, represented uh, sources of income. What happens now with this new wave of um, privatization, but I would say in a sense it's more like uh, this kind of uh, really uh, peripheralization, this kind of reprimarization of the economy, meaning that you basically now have to not only privatize and give everything away to uh, uh, private uh, interest, uh, local uh, capital if possible, but you also have these uh, raw materials that are being um, uh, put on the market. And in this context, now there is this uh, first steps are to have this uh, private uh, um, managers for state companies like the um, uh, this aviation, uh, national aviation uh, company. Uh, but it proved to be such a big failure that even the government that promoted it uh, had to take a step back and uh, bring uh, uh, again a state delegate, you know, because it was complete, uh, complete failure. <coughs> So I think we should look at this in mean, this kind of broader, I mean that this is for the Romanian context, I'm not very familiar with what's going on here, but in the Romanian context I think this new way of privatization and appointing these uh, private um, uh, managers for the state companies is this kind of dramatic uh, opening up again to the, to the global uh, capital in a very brutal, brutal way. Okay. I have a question too from Madeleine. Um, and then you were talking about uh, the so-called cultural or creative workers, and I'm interested, uh, do you have in your country, do you have any experience of uh, organizing these workers, what, in, what, in whichever way, uh, for a progressive cause? Uh, have you tackled this problem, this issue? Have you found uh, uh, a solution or something, uh, or a hint, or, a, or, you, or, or, I don't know, like a way how to do that? Have you, have you come up with something? What do you mean in this uh, some mobilizations in the culture sphere or, or other? Yeah, in the sphere of the creative workers, yeah. No, I wouldn't say so. It has never been. <laughs> they have participated in some progressive movements. Can you speak a bit louder, please? Certainly. Um, some create, uh, cultural workers were actually involved in uh, these huge protests uh, against the commodification, uh, the commas like of nature, for example, but they have never been organized for a progressive, um, for progressive policies in the cultural sphere. 